I've worked with hundreds of women entrepreneurs to help them market their businesses. Behind their businesses, they all have stories to tell. Whether it's battling mommy guilt, starting a business after being fired from a six-figure job, or realizing they needed to pivot and forge an uncharted path, they've all experienced something on their journey to success. I'm one of these women too, and I'm here to share our stories on Bright Girls in Business. What's up? What's up, everybody? It's another Wednesday, and we are back here with the Bright Girls in Business show. I am Chanel Yarber, the bright girl and the curator of the show, the host, the hostess with the mostest. And I am here with a lovely guest that I just found out we have some a couple things in common, actually. Um, and I'm really excited to chat with her, Miss Ada Crenshaw. Hi. Of yes, of Ada Crenshaw LLC and Infinite Legacy Mobile Notary. Now, Miss Crenshaw just recently did a TED Talk, and I told y'all last week I'm a TED Talk junkie. So when I saw her on LinkedIn and she was posting her videos and she was, you know, doing all the things on the stage, I was like so amazed and I knew that I had to have her on here. So today we are going to talk about what she talked about in her TED Talk, which is the difference between success and failure. Now, many times we, you know, we consider success one thing or failure another thing. So we're going to dig in a little bit, learn more about her story, learn more about uh, what success is and what failure is, and we're going to get right to it. So she worked in the aerospace uh, in the aerospace field for many years, and she recently trans transitioned into being a full time entrepreneur. And so we're going to talk about her career. We're going to talk about what it looks like to work as a woman in a male-dominated field. And we're going to talk about, of course, entrepreneurship. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, yes. So I'm just excited. Like I said, I saw you on LinkedIn, mm -hmm. and, and we've been connected for quite some time. I don't yes. even know how we got connected. I don't I, I don't you know. know. What? I don't remember either. I don't know. It's but, okay because okay. I'm connected to a lot of people. I that am too. It's, yes. it's, it is what it is. But we yes. have a lot of like inner connected circles. So we are sorority sisters. Yes, we are. Yes. Yes, we are. Alpha, Kappa, Kappa Alpha, Alpha Sorority, Sorority Incorporated. Incorporated. Yes. And we also have quite a few mutual connections and, and friends and sorors and the HBCU connection yes. and... She's from Louisiana. My family's from Louisiana. So we got a whole little Louisiana little hodgepodge the way. thing Louisiana going on all here. The way. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. So I know that, you know, service and all of that stuff. I mean, you couldn't be, you know, in the illustrious sorority that we share if, yes. you, if you didn't have a heart of service. <laughs> but right. how does that play into, you know, who you are, what you do, and even into your career? Well, uh, starting out, I would say my mom was a registered nurse. She's a retired registered nurse, I should say. And she has such a giving heart. Um, seeing Alpha Kappa Alpha exemplified in the women in my family, you know, it was something like, you know you're going to do this. My mom had me in so many AKA events as a little girl, um, and it's like, all I see is pink and green. All I see is pink and green. And so just watching the women of my family um, give and be so active in doing things. And every time there was some sort of fashion show or some kind of something, okay, we're going to have you in this. I was debutante. Um, I was little Miss uh, Fashionista. Um, what was it called? Uh, little Miss Fashion. Uh, AKA was when they used to have that a lot. Oh, yeah, the pet, yeah. I know yes. what you're talking about the pageants. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I won. Oh, so true. I still hold the crown because the last time they had it was like 1984, 85. So, yes, I still hold the crown. So um, I always joke about that. Uh, but coming from a family that loves to give, my dad always, he was known as the meat man. He barbecued. He could, uh his barbecue was just, to me, the best, the best. Um, and so watching all that, it's like, okay, I know what I want to do. 
um, when I got to college, it's like, yes, I want to do this, but the opportunity didn't come uh, when I wanted to do it. Mm-hmm. So it plays a big part because I love to help people. I love to help you know, people who are in need uh, really make a difference in doing things that will maybe uplift someone, make them feel better no matter what situation they're in. Just giving a kind word to someone can really pep up their day. You may not know them, but just passing by someone and say, hey, that's a cute outfit. They're like, oh, okay. It's, you, you see, they're like, oh, I didn't even think about but okay, thank you. So it's been in my family um, and, my, and the elders in my family. So giving is something that's natural to me. I could tell when I when I watched your TED talk and I was listening to you, um, I could tell that what you were saying was really heartfelt. Like I really connected to your story and it really resonated with me just as a woman Mm -hmm. and, you know, going through different things in life, different changes of life, um, career ups and downs and all of that stuff. And just kind of centering yourself and understanding what is success and what's failure, what what is true success and what is true failure. Because some, some of the stuff that we think about as success and failure is, um, I'll say, somewhat superficial sometimes. Yeah. So what's your, your definition of success versus your definition of failure? I would say that my definition of success is walking in the path that God has put before me. Um, I believe in staying on task on my path because living in my purpose and living with the purpose that he talked to me about is much more fulfilling and is so much more brighter. Um, And my success is each time he takes me to a different level and I attain that and I know it's in his will, that's my success. My success is you know, starting, you know, foundation or helping foundations, really, um, that's to me a marker of success is to be able to give and give so much, I you know, have so much money that I can't give it away fast enough. To me, that's where I see myself in the future and what I'm working hard to do because I just want to be able to help the homeless, help people who, you know, may not be able to afford food um, and just doing that full time, I would say that's my mark for success. And what I feel that in the end, I can honestly stand before God and say, I've used all your talents. I've used all the talents you've given me. And I can firmly say that. And so I want to be able to do that. And to me, that's my success, what I want to achieve. Okay. So on the flip side of that, what would you say would be failure? I think failure, I would look at failure as a lesson. Not to say, you know, if you don't get what you want, what you think you want. It's always something that will bring it back to me when I think about when I don't, you know, when someone tells me no. They don't need my services. It's like, okay, maybe I'm not a good fit for you, but I'll be a good fit for somebody else. I take failures as lessons because I think when you fail is when you give up. When you give up and say, I'm just going to quit because it's getting too hard. I can't take this. I, that's a failure to me. I mean, I feel that if you give it your all, if you really gave it your all and said, you know what, I, I, this is not going to work. Because there are some times that, you know, people will start businesses and for whatever reason, it just fails. But I feel that in that failure, there were some lessons along the way where you could say, well, you know what, if I would have did this, then I probably would have got a different outcome. So I would want people to not look at failures as I'm a failure. It's like, no, this is a lesson. What did it teach me? What could I have done differently? So I don't want to think of failure as just not you know, being worthy of something, if that makes sense. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. I, I hear people say, and I, and I totally believe failure isn't final because we all on a daily basis as we take chances and we do different things, we don't always know that everything is going to work out the way that we intended it to or the way that we wanted it to. Um, but like you said, if you can take a lesson from it and learn and grow and move forward, 
um, then I think that that's the best way to fail forward fail and not, forward. you know, make it a final failure. Right. Because with entrepreneurs, it's like you fail, at, quote unquote, fail at something, but then you start something else. It's like, OK, that didn't work. So, all right, let me figure out and pivot and do something else. So I always think being an entrepreneur is so much has so much freedom to it because you really get to think how you want to think and be such a creative uh, that it's like, okay, this business didn't do well. Okay, you know what? Maybe if I probably an- analyze the situation, probably there were some things that I missed along the way and shouldn't have done or should have done more research about it. And so it's just, to me, it's everything, life is just so everything that you make it, everything that you want to be, because I feel that you can have it all. People say you can't, but you can have it all, but your definition of having it all is different than someone else. So I always think that black women, you can have it all, but what is having it all meant for you? Mm-hmm. That's true. Yeah. That's true. I think a lot of times, especially in the social media age that we live in, and you know, if you are an entrepreneur and you're following a lot of entrepreneurs, it's very easy to fall into that comparison trap. Mm-hmm. Um, and I see a lot of women also who are transitioning out of um, corporate into entrepreneurship, and they haven't quite figured themselves out or figured out what it is that they want to do. They just know they want to get out of this corporate space. Mm-hmm. Um I was one of those women. <laughs> I was like, okay, this is not, this ain't working. You know, I was getting these jobs and I was working them and um, it was, it was crazy. It was crazy working in corporate. And, and to be quite transparent, I just went back to work into corporate and it's been, <laughs> it's been a challenge mentally for me just because I worked my way out. Yeah. And now I'm like going back and I'm like, oh, Lord, oh, Lord, this is this is a little, uh, you know, a little weird. It's like I'm trying to get my sea legs together. So you are on the opposite end. You're exit. You just exited. Yes. So what was (laughs) what was that like that transition like for you? Because you don't have the same guardrails. You don't have the same markers that you do in corporate as you do in entrepreneurship to tell you whether you succeed and fail and on the right track or anything like that. Yeah, um, I would say whew, it wasn't by choice, but yeah, I was laid off and I was really like, it shocked me at first. Like, wait a minute now. It's like, I'm cleared for all these programs here. You know, I got a top secret clearance. I, I'm the only one that's clear to do A, B, and C. And it's like, you laying me off? Like, who going to do, I'm doing the job of four people. So who's going to do that? And I was shocked. I was in shock. I couldn't really say anything when they were telling me over the phone. I had just got my lights back on. Uh, it's February 19th at 1.30 p.m. I had just got my lights back on. It's when the snowmageddon happened. Oh, yeah, yeah. And got that phone call. I got an email first. Then I got the phone call, called in to the WebEx, and yeah, they said, oh, blah, I didn't really remember what he said, but it was some, it was like mumbo jumbo in my mind. All And then when I heard, oh, you know what, we're going to have to let you go, and I just sat there over the phone like, hmm, okay, and I remember just saying, okay, and they had, you know, at the end, they asked me, it was like, okay, so are there any questions? I was like, hmm, so who do I talk to about my compensation package? Um, what are the steps I need to do to get this, you know, since this is, is going to be happening? It wasn't any other question. Where's, what's my compensation package going to look like? Because at that point, I had been praying to God. I said, God, I want more time to really work on my business again. And I had an outline in my mind. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, maybe like five years. Ah. And I said, okay, then I'm going to transition and do this, and then I'm going to do that, and then I'm going to really be out of corporate. I had my own plan in my mind. And God was like, okay, you know what? Nope. 
just going to push you out there. Fly, little bird. You can. So (laughs) it felt like that. And the first thing in my mind was, what am I going to do about my mom? The last words I was talking to my dad, he said, make sure you take take care of your mama, baby girl. And I said, I will. You know, that's a given. And that was the first thing. It wasn't about me. It was, how am I going to take care of my mom? How am I going to do this? I told my dad, I promised him that I would take care of my mom. And, you know, when I got off the phone, I did cry. I did. And I allowed myself to feel all the feelings that I was feeling. Um, And I felt at the time my mom, I don't know, she must have sensed something was wrong because right after I got off the phone with my managers, my mom called and she asked me, is baby girl, are you okay? And I was trying to hold back to her, say, Mama, I'm okay. Mama's it's no. Just, I'm okay, Mama's Mama. no. I'm okay. And she said, okay. She says, you feeling okay? I said, yes, ma'am, I'm feeling fine. It's just my allergies. Didn't want to tell her at the time. And then got off the phone 20 minutes later. Are you okay, baby girl? I said, I'm okay, Mom. I'm okay. I had to get myself together. Because I didn't want to be emotional with her on the phone. I don't know why, but I went home that following weekend, and I told her, Mom, I've been laid off. And she said, hmm. She says, are you okay? I said, yes, Mom, I'm, I'm okay now. I said, when you called me, I said I had just got off the phone with them talking to me. And I said, I couldn't talk to you because I was so emotional. And you wouldn't have understood nothing I said. And I told her, I said, well, she said, so what are you going to do? I said, you know, I think I am going to start my business. I am going to start my business. And her exact words were, I think that's the best decision you could make. And at that moment, I felt my mom and my dad talking to me at the same time. And my heart just, I just felt like it started crying. I was like, okay, this is the sign I needed. Not if God didn't give me the sign, but it was the sign and the words that I needed. And after that, I checked out. I mentally checked out. I wrote an email very kind of sliding, you know, pulling the emergency cord and sliding off the plane kind of email. Yeah, that that bridge was burnt. And it was just like very professional, but it was basically like it's business. And I simply said that in my email, it's business. This I understood because yeah, I was the most senior on the project. So you know, kind of goes down when you do that. And so I checked out. In 60 days, I had health insurance. I already had my notary license. I had already had the bank account set up. I had everything ready to go once I walked out in 60 days from that job. So every paycheck that I got, I put some away, put some in my business. Put some away, put something in my business. Um, And it was just like all go. So when I walked out, I felt so free. Mm. For once, I felt like I'm black. I can be myself. I no longer have Mm. to code switch and lighten my voice. Because if I talk to you with too much passion, you're going to feel that I'm I'm angry. angry. Yeah. And, you know, I knew it was time for me to go because my attitude had changed. After George Floyd, it was that was my tipping point because I've always been, my dad, if he was here, he was there, I've always a rebel with a cause. Uh, you know, being pro-black, being, you know, having family, having elders teach me about black history that I didn't get in the schools, having that blessing. So I've always been that way, but that was my tipping point because I'm like, I'm tired of being treated this way, Mm -hmm. that way, and it got to a point where I feel like, God, you need to take me out because I could feel like one small thing 
all right, y'all were going to be walking me out anyway. So my journey, I had my head focused and clients ready to go once I walked out. Because I, to me, it's like I got to make it happen. There's no turning back. I'm not going back to corporate because I, nothing has changed. Nothing has really changed yeah. with everything going on. Nothing has really changed. So I'm doing everything I can not to go back. If I could, if I wanted it had to, when it came down to it, oh, I have no problem with doing that. Uh, but my goal, I feel, is my purpose is bigger than corporate. And I feel like I can't be me as when I'm in corporate. I'm so I'm I'm loving where you're going with this because I totally resonate with you. I hear you saying, you know, you were a senior leader on this team. You've been in this industry for, you know, however long. And I'm sure you probably might have trained the people that were working I over tra- you. I you trained know. my manager. See, mm-hmm. Okay. Yes, so ma'am. so let's go there. Cause and I <laughs> <laughs> let's go there. Because I, as as black women. In corporate, I, I've always felt like I was a corporate misfit. This Look, now this is both our testimony. Yes. <laughs> I've always felt like I was a corporate misfit. Like I just did not belong in this space. Like you said, you have to code switch. You have to tone yourself down. You have to watch how, what you wear, how you wear it, how you show up. Do you, do you come earlier than everybody else so nobody thinks that you're the late per- I mean, it's all these mental hoops that you go through. Just to show up as a leader in this space. So yes. when it came down to them, you know, letting you go, I mean, I hear you saying, you know, you were, you were crying and all of that stuff. But at that point, did you feel like you had failed or? No. No. Not at all. It was, I was kind of relieved in a way because I hadn't been happy. I, I, the job was literally killing me mm. health wise. Um, and I, I knew I was just, I didn't think it would happen that way. Um, but you know, you know what the elders say is, you know, when you make plans, God laughs. So yeah, he was laughing as I was making my like, Lord, this is five years. Okay. I had a vision. <laughs> okay, this is five years. Vision. This is what we're going to do. I had a vision <laughs> for leaving Yeah. on my terms. But when I sat down and realized that it's like, okay, I'm tripping because I did not have control over the situation. That was my thing. I wanted to control that situation. Do you think you really would have left in five years? Like, really? Uh, yeah. Okay. I had had enough. I've I had enough of being passed up multiple times for a management position um, because I wasn't part of the old white boys club. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I was my ex manager actually told pulled me off of a project to put a white guy on a project because he felt that you know needs to be a little bit more softer and not so forceful, and you know. Yeah, okay. So I keep, as me, working in aerospace and defense for 21 years, it's like you learn to keep copious notes, follow up with email, because each time I was wrong, I was the one who went to HR. Mm. And it felt like, of course, I knew the game. HR is really for the company, oh, yes, not to protect for you. Them. Absolutely. So because I had emails, because I had different things, It was solved because I never, I was the type where, okay, HR, you going to fix it? Okay, I'm going to give you a week to get back with me. If not, I'm going over your head. I was not afraid to do that. I don't care. You're going to solve this problem because obviously I have documentation. I, I keep, I was taught when I first got into aerospace by the seasoned employees, which I was so looking back so thankful because they hit me to the game early like this is how I really go this is really what they do and that builds up because my manager who I trained you know he began to show signs of being resentful being intimidated of me because um 
yeah, you had an MBA, nothing wrong with the MBA, but it's like, no, I got a master's in IT and project management. And it's nothing saying I'm better than you, but after I got my master's, after they paid for it, then he starts saying, well, you can have my job. You can have Mm. my job. I'm like, I don't want your job. I don't want to be a manager in corporate. You give up too much, and I don't want that because my family is number one. God and family are number one. And I never let that waver all the 21 years I worked. And so being fed up with that, it was my goal, any means any means, to get out in five years or sooner. Because I was done. I was tired. And I'm like, I'm not going to let this job kill me. And I, being treated a certain way after my father passed, I didn't, I didn't like it. Um, and there was one manager who gave me an ultimatum right after my father died. And because I said I had to go home and see about to take care of some things for my mom. And she literally told me either it's your job or it's your family. Oh, I oh said, no, ma'am. I said, hmm. I said, okay, then. I went to my office, got my purse took off my badge, walked in her manager's office, and I said, here, debrief me right now. Wow. And he was like, what? Wait, what? What's what's going on? And I told him what she told me. I said, she gave me an ultimatum. Either it's my job or it's my family. Of course it's my family. I said, nah. I said, I'm done. Debrief me. If you want to walk me down to security and debrief me, I'll walk down there myself. Y'all can finish the paperwork. I'm done. He said, oh, no, 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 no. She's in violation. She's in violation. Mm. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. So Lisa says she retired. And so I I stand fast on that. I don't, there was never no fear in my mind when it comes to my family. You give me an ultimatum, all right. You don't need to, it's okay. But that's the things that I dealt with in corporate America, in aerospace and defense, when there were times when I was the only woman in the room, I was the only black in the room, um, and you had to be in this room full of men with their measuring sticks, because it's like, okay, I don't have time for this. I was the one, if I'm running the meeting, no, we're not going to do all this sideways stuff. We're going to stick to the meeting at hand. I got better things to do. And I don't think they like that coming from me. Of course not. (laughs) So, yeah, like, what 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 to do? mm, Yeah, that's what I'm doing. So, I feel that it was time. It was time that I left that company because out of all the years that I've worked, that, that was my last seven years was the absolute hardest. Mm. And I it's seven years I don't want to ever live again. Relive. I don't want to relive that. So you talked about a little bit of this and the transition and all of that stuff in your TED talk. And I want to make sure that we take a we take a moment to watch a clip of this TED talk because oh, okay. I was like I said, I was so excited <laughs> <laughs> when I saw you. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to play a piece of the video and then we're going to come back because I got some questions okay. about it. 21, February 19th at 1.30 to be exact. Um, I was laid off. I was told I would, my services were no longer needed. That was a curveball that really took me out. I was like, what in the world? Me laid off? No, couldn't be. But yes. Was I prepared? Well, financially I was prepared, but emotionally I wasn't. So I had to think to myself, I still have to take care of my mother. That's what I promised my dad before he took his last breath. I was going to take care of my mom. So really the gist of what you talked about, because the, the topic of the show today is the differentiator between success and failure. And you talked about preparation as being that differentiator between success and failure. And I love the way you spun it up. If y'all are watching this, make sure that you go 
and you go to TEDx McKinney and watch the full talk because it's really good. Um, but what, what do you advise people that are hit with things, like you just said, unexpected, and they don't know how to prepare, or they, they couldn't even fathom how to prepare for something like that? Ooh. To differentiate them from succeeding through that transition or failing in it? I would say allow yourself, when something comes at you so quick, allow yourself to feel your emotions. Allow yourself that step back because when you take you take drastic steps when you're very emotional. You make irrational decisions when you're emotional, when you're crying, when you're like, I don't know what to do right now. Feel your feelings. Allow yourself to feel those feelings. You get suddenly laid off. Okay, what is my backup plan? I don't care whether you are, you know, some people say never have a backup plan. But... I always say there need, I wouldn't say a backup plan, but a plan B. What's your avenue B? Something comes at you fast, let's say a layoff. Okay, do I want to use some of my, re my, my resources that I have and branch out on my own? Or do I really want to find something else until I figure this thing out? And you really have to think about, think about it when you're not emotional. And I always tell people, be prepared. If you feel no job is secure. I'm living testimony. These jobs though. ain't loyal. You are a line, <laughs> you are a line item on their loyal. books. They don't care about you. They don't care whether you have kids, you don't, you're taking care of parents. They don't care about that. So when you're faced with something, take a breather, cry, Walk, do whatever you have to do, but m come back and make the decision to say, okay, I got to do something. Some companies, if they offer you time, like my company, I had 60 days. So if you have 60 days or 30 days to figure out what you're going to do, use that 60 days wisely. Use that 90 days, 30 days wisely. Find something within the company. Go to a different division. Um, figure it out. You don't have to stay. You can just transfer and go somewhere else. Um, that will take the pressure off of, okay, I want to start a business. I don't know how. I tell you from someone who has gone through it, I knew about entrepreneurship because I had my first company that I had to stop while I was working in corporate, which is Ada Crenshaw LLC. Mm -hmm. So... I knew like, okay, these are the things that I have to do if I want to pick this up. And I had already had being a notary kind of just starting out in mind, but it's like you have to think on your feet. Those days leading up to your departure are crucial. You handle it by really thinking like, okay, if you can't make a decision about I want to be an entrepreneur, I think I want to know what I want to do, then transfer within your company. Find something else in the meantime until you can be like, okay, this is what you're going to have to do. Because making a decision to be an entrepreneur at that time, it's like, I got to get my own health insurance. I got to get my own dental vision, things like mm -hmm. that. I had to line that up. If you're ready for it, there's no time like the present because there's no perfect time. I was waiting for the perfect time, my mm. five-year plan. That was my perfect time to leave because I had this in order. I had that in order. Sometimes life doesn't give you that opportunity. Most times life doesn't give you the it, perfect it time. It doesn't. It is what you got to gotta. You got to take it. You got to <laughs> yeah. take it. You got to If you have time, if you have savings, if you have a 401K, if you have a house, there are many ways to fund your business. If you have that, then you have some time. You can buy yourself some time to kind of see and, okay, how you should go, how you should start off. Because the whole point during that time is you need something that's going to make you money. You really need to start making money um, because you don't want to blow through your savings. Mm -hmm. So I would say being prepared, even if you feel that you're comfortable in your position, Ask yourself, what else 
could I do? Uh, and it doesn't necessarily have to be an entrepreneur. You could say, oh, I'm going to start investing in income property. Right. I'm going to start investing in st- uh, stocks or whatever. Have an option. Always have an option. That's the key. Always have an option because just like I was confident in handing in my badge is because I knew I had a backup. And when you think that about that and you say, okay, I got to prepare, I got to do these things, and I got to do it fast, you got to stay on track. You can't let nothing, why you still have that job for that amount of time, it's best to kind of use it to get yourself, put some in savings, build your business. So everybody's situation is different. Mine was being prepared along the way. My dad, when he asked me to take over the bills and stuff and the affairs of the house, that wasn't a lead-up conversation. That was, baby girl, I can't do it no more. Mm. Okay. You know, okay, I I got it. Because my dad said, okay, I got it. I could do it. I was freaking out. But I was like, okay, I can do this. So because I know how to handle my business, my dad was like, you know how to handle your business. I taught you well. Just do the same. It was the same thing, but times two. So if anybody is thinking about I want to quit, I wanted to quit. But with quitting, I wouldn't have got the compensation package. It's something with quitting that, to me, is so freeing. Um, I wish I could have given my two weeks notice. But in actuality, it's like, you didn't even give me a two-week notice as saying that you were going to lay me off. So, okay, right. where's the formality? What, what's yeah. in that? So being prepared is all how you look at it and how you prepare yourself. For a good example, like... You got car insurance. For what if you get into an accident? What if somebody hits you and they don't have accident? You know, they don't have insurance. You got insurance for that to prepare for that. You got homeowner's insurance. You got life insurance. You should. Um, You got all these insurance, types of insurance, and, you know, to catch you for life's unexpected moments. So why not do the same in your life? You know, we, as we all have seen, jobs are not secure. What is your backup? You got a consistent paycheck coming in. Start investing that a little bit more aggressively so you can see a return and stack your money so you can be like, okay, you let me go? All right, then. Mm-hmm. I'm good because I got something I can fall back on for a little bit while I figure out what I do. I love that. I love that. And I wish I had... Um I wish I had known you and had watched your TED talk about five, six months ago. (laughs) I was prepared, not realizing that I was prepared. And like you said, being mentally stable, like not allowing yourself to just freak out and like make decisions in your emotions. I did all of that. (laughs) Yeah, you got to. You have to feel, yeah, you got to. You freak out. It's like, what am I doing? What am I doing? What am I doing? Because I did the same thing. I freaked out. And I went through that emotional roller coaster. And I gave myself the week and I turned my phone off. And I told my mom, Mom, I just need some time. I'm turning my phone off. Everything is okay. And I turned my phone off for the whole weekend. Binge watched Netflix, ate ice cream, ate what I wanted, and cried a little, prayed a lot. Um, I was on my knees. I was praying and praying and crying. And come Monday morning, and the odd thing is, it was 7.35 a.m., which was the same time I was born. Mm. Um, actually, I was born at 7.35 p.m., though. But at 7.35 a.m., I had a, when I woke up, I had a moment of clarity. And got up, had some coffee, sent that final email off, and I mentally checked out. It's like, okay, let's do um, let's Let's try to do this. And get myself together. So if you freak out, if you cry, you go through this emotional roller coaster, allow yourself to feel that. But not crying and trying to make a rash, you know, just irrational mm-hmm. decision like, okay, this is what I'm going to do. then you start getting in the quicksand. Yes. Uh-huh. So just allow yourself, if you need a day or two or whatever, to kind of get 
okay, let me get my mind straight right now, wrap my head around this. Then you can kind of see with the clearer picture, you're still emotional. It's not going away over a weekend or over a day, but allow yourself to be like, okay, I did, I went through this. Now, what am I, what were my goals? What would I, what was I trying to do while I was in corporate trying to get away? Mm-hmm. You can do it. You just need to have the right people around you during that time that you know that's not going to steer you wrong, give you bad advice. That's good. That's real good. Like, that's real, real good. I'm, I'm, as you're saying this, I feel like you're talking to me retrospectively. <laughs> like I said, I went through a major transition some months ago. Um, And a lot of what you're saying is like sound, meaty wisdom. So I appreciate it. I'm listening. I'm taking it in. I'm like, yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. That's how you do it. Yep. That's how you pivot. Yeah. That's how you keep going. It's how you keep going because as black people, we're resilient. Oh, yeah. There's resiliency in our blood. And, you know, I going through different things in my life, if you would have met me two years ago, you wouldn't have got this. You wouldn't have got this at all. And God was taking me through a journey. Mm. And, you know, the transformation is just beginning for me. And being able to really stop and say, God, I surrender all. I'm tired of doing it my way. That was my prayer. It was like, God, I surrender everything to you. I'm tired of doing things my way. I'm tired of hitting a brick wall. I'm tired of feeling so anxious and being in control. I release my control. I'm getting in the back seat and allowing you just saying, hey, God, you you need to be in the driver's seat. I'm not, I can't do this anymore. And once I did that, it was like, I felt a relief. And there have been times I wanted to put my hand on that steering wheel and be like, okay, God, you're not going, you're not going fast enough now. But I have to pull myself back and say, okay, trust the process. Trust whatever process that you know you're going through. When I rely on my faith to get me to point A to point B, I feel that it's much easier that way. I'm less stressed. There are times, yes, when I even question, like, what am I doing? What have I got myself into? That's all a part of being an entrepreneur. Mm-hmm. You're going to have those emotional roller coasters as an entrepreneur. If you don't, something wrong. Something is You're off. not feeling nothing. You're not <laughs> feeling <is> anything. <laughs> Something's <laughs> off. So I always pride myself. It's like I went to an HBCU. So obviously they taught us you operate in excellence. Uh-huh. My dad always said, if you're not going to do something right, don't do it at all. Don't get out there and half-ass. That's what he would tell me. <laughs> and it's like, you're not going to embarrass us. You're a Crenshaw woman. You're not going to embarrass us. So get out there and do it and do it right. True enough. Okay. So, you know, we both went to HBCU. So, you know, the operating in excellence is not an option. It's, it's like, no, you're going to operate in mm-hmm. excellence. So that, you know, that fire, because I'm proud of where I went to school. And I feel that there's nothing like an HBCU. Nothing like it. So, you told us what the differentiator was between success and failure. It's preparation. I love that. I, I'm telling you, when I heard it, I was like, it's so simple. Sometimes, like, the deepest wisdom is so simple. <laughs> but I always try to do something fun with my guests before we wrap up. Okay. All right. Okay. You ready? Yeah, okay. I'm ready. All right. I got I to gotta have a little fun with you because okay. I just like to, you know, I'm just a jovial person. I like to crack jokes and act silly. My friends and everybody knows this. So I always have five questions that I ask people. They're always different. So you'll never know what I'm going to oh, come up with. Oh, okay. Okay. There's I'm no ready. right or wrong answer. Okay. I just like to see what people are going to say and how they respond to the questions. I'm so ready. <laughs> I'm ready. All right. So my first question is, if we end this interview and... You walk outside, and on the ground, there's a a lottery ticket for $10 million. It's a winner. What are you going to do? Look on the back of it to see if they signed it. And if they didn't sign it, I'm taking it and cashing it in. Okay, so what you going to do with the money? 
ten uh, percent would definitely go to my church. Um, then I would probably do a lot of updates to my mom's house because uh, we have property, still have our property. So it would be a lot of updates to my mom's house, um, and I would, me would be last. I would donate, and then I would try to figure out what I wanted to do with the money invested, definitely. Buy income property, definitely. So that would be my, what I would do. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. You had a plan. You had a plan. What you say? <laughs> prepare. prepare. She's prepared Ready for that. Prepare. If, you don't, if you don't sign the back of it, oh, okay then. So I'm not going to walk around. Hey, anybody miss $10 million? Uh, yeah, no. no, I'm not doing that either. Put in the purse and we'll just and go. Keep it moving. Mm-hmm. That's right. That was a, that was a little blessing. Mm-hmm. All right. Mm-hmm. Here's my next question. You've been given an elephant as a birthday gift. A real elephant. A real live elephant with mm. a trunk and tusks and ears, the whole thing. A real live elephant. You can't give it away. You can't sell it. What are you gonna do with the elephant? Buy a property with like maybe 50 acres and then have him and get some more elephants so he'll have some friends so he won't be alone. Look at you thinking about the elephant. Like <laughs> nobody ever thinks about the elephant in his well be. I've heard all types of different answers to that. Nobody else has thought about the elephant having friends. Yeah, you want the elephant to be lonely, so you want to create a habitat for it. For the elephant, so he'll thrive because you don't want to, you know, have him die. So I have to bring in somebody that knows how to, you know, take care of an elephant. So yeah, I would have to do all that. Well, your ten million dollars is going to the elephant. Yeah, yeah. Your ten million dollars going to the elephant now. Yeah. Depending on where I buy the property. So if I buy the property in Louisiana, see, that's cheaper down there. So it's always a strategy to it. I wouldn't buy it out here. I would go to Louisiana and do it. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So we're going to get the elephant some friends. So my next question is, what is your all-time favorite place to vacation to? Jamaica. Why? Uh, I don't, you know what, I feel like, I feel like it's home for some odd reason. I don't know. I go every year. Um, okay. So it just feels like home to me. I really like it because it's so laid back. I'm laid back. I go and I relax. I have my my hotel that I stay at, and it's just relaxing. So yeah, I know a lot of people probably say Jamaica, but I, I really love Jamaica though. Okay. What part of, are you going to like? Kingston? Ocho Rios. Ocho, Ocho Rios. Rios. Okay. Mm-hmm. Nice. Okay. So. You're on a deserted island. Besides food and water, what two items do you have to have? My dog. What kind of dog? I have a miniature schnauzer. Oh, I used to have a puppy cousin that was a miniature schnauzer. Her name was Tish. Rest in peace, Tish. Oh, rest in peace. Yeah, I would take my dog and I would um, take some sunscreen. Okay. (laughs) Preparate. Look. (laughs) Prepared, okay. <laughs> yeah, that's some sunscreen. You know, you want to burn. I'm sure I can catch some fish around. So you know, I don't want to burn. Uh. Okay. Listen, you are living up to your. You are living up to your TED talk about being prepared. <laughs> gotta, stay so you gotta stay ready. You gotta stay ready. You gotta stay ready. So, so you, you don't, don't have, have to get, get ready. ready. That's it. That's right. That's it. All right. My final question okay. is: Which superpower would you rather have? The ability to unlock every door. Or the ability to shape shift. I say shape shift. Okay. Why? I think that'll be cool to shape shift into stuff. Just go and and shape shift <laughs> into things, you know, like a monument or something, just to be watching people. Um, I feel like opening every door is like there's no surprises in life. That would be boring. Hmm. So I like to have surprises. I like to see what's in store. I don't want to see everything. Is it then be boring? So yeah, I want to shape shift into stuff because that'll be fun. I like that. I like that. That was fun. See, <laughs> you was over there like holding your breath, like, oh lord, what is she gonna? Do? Like I was ready. I was like, rapid fire. Okay, I'm ready. She's like, what is ready. she gonna ask me? What is she gonna ask me? Well, in closing, tell me or tell the people that are watching. Um, how can they reach you? Tell us a little bit about your business and what you do, and how can they reach you if they need your help? 
Uh, well, it's Ada Crenshaw LLC. I relaunched the company in uh, the late October. I will be relaunching that. And that will provide small business advising as far as helping you create your blueprint and your foundation on getting started being an entrepreneur. Um, also doing speaking engagements. And also I passed my life insurance exam this past week. Yay. So I'll be doing life insurance. So that is what Ada Crenshaw LLC is. We It's like I want people to have someone to say, I got my LLC, now what I do? What? Let me help you create that blueprint so you can go and tailor it for each company that you want to do. Because I didn't have that. So I would want to do something and help people because I have, a connect, I have connections. So I, I'm not doing it all, but I can definitely help. Uh, Infinite Legacy Mobile Notary, of course. Mobile Notary, I do loan signings. I'm also a licensed wedding officiant. Yep, I do that too. Let me find me a booth so you. Can yeah, a girl, I got you. Yeah. I do destination. You gotta, do you do you set up the booth? Like, do you hook the booths up? You don't do that part. You just do. No, I'm there just to marry you. Gotta you gotta go off. a step. You gotta go a step further for the women like me. You know, you gotta. I have matchmaking to, service in there or something. What? Matchmaking? Oh, girl. <laughs> I know a good event planner. Okay. So they can help you plan right. in that event. I'll just show up and get you married real quick. The vows real right. short so you can get, say I do and then get on to the honeymoon and the rest of your and life. And we're going to Jamaica for the honeymoon. Okay, then. Okay, because you already... I do destinations, so I'll fly there. I give you a good rate. Okay. Yeah. So I have those two companies, and the best way to get in contact with me is Ada Crenshaw. At adacrenshaw.com. All right, y'all heard it here first. Y'all get in touch with Miss Ada, my soul LinkedIn Ada. or LinkedIn. <laughs> yes, if you're, LinkedIn, if you're on LinkedIn, LinkedIn is really good. If you don't remember uh, the email address, LinkedIn is really good. I really check my LinkedIn. So, yes, she does because that's how we communicate all the time. Uh, yes. So, yeah. Thank you so much for taking some time this evening to Thank chat with me. Thank you for I inviting enjoyed. me. Yes. This was I such enjoyed. a blessing. I was so mad because I was really supposed to be live at your TED Talk. And because my job had tickets, we sponsored mm -hmm. the event. And I didn't get a ticket, so. Oh. But anyway, I saw it anyway on video. Okay. But I wanted to be in the audience, so ethic. now I had to, you know, I had to bring you on so we could talk. <laughs> okay. Okay. I really appreciate you for giving me this opportunity. This is such a blessing. And I really thank you for this opportunity to be on a podcast with you. This is so fun. Yeah, absolutely. This is my joy. I love to talk to black women entrepreneurs. I love everybody has a story. Yeah. So a lot of times people don't think that they have a story or they're like, oh, it's just me because I'm like that too. I'm like, this is me. And then people are like, no, you should tell your story. And so I just really enjoy that. So what I'm going to say now that I'm saying this is if you are a black woman entrepreneur and you have a story to tell that's unique, a success story, or even a failure story, I need you to reach out to me if you want to be on the Bright Girls in Business podcast. Right now, I am booked up through December, but I know it's a lot of stories to be told out here. I'm booked up through December, but if you want to be on the show, holler at me. I would love to have you. And next week... I'm bringing on another bright girl. This is my girl. This is my, I mean, I, and I think I met her on LinkedIn. LinkedIn, yeah. Link, <laughs> LinkedIn, is the, LinkedIn, LinkedIn yes. is the business. LinkedIn is the business. It's the so business. So Miss Mia Francis Poulin will be on. She is a mom of special needs children, and she's a mompreneur who is out here doing it big. And so we're going to talk just about her balance between, you know, mom life. She just had a new baby. She already had two kids. So we're going to talk about mompreneurship next week. So if you're a mom, you want to be in business, you are in business, come back. Same bad time, same bad channel. Watch us next week, Wednesday at 6 p.m. Central on the Bright Girls in Business show. See y'all later. Build a brand that grows your business. Let Bright Girl Media take the guesswork out of marketing your business. Our team is dedicated to helping you build a brand that is so powerful, it woos your ideal clients. We offer custom website development, email marketing, social media marketing, and more. With membership subscriptions as low as $39 per month, we have solutions for every budget. Let's create a plan of action to make sure your business wins. Visit us at brightgirl.media to learn how we can empower you to reach